period of time over the pandemic and I was just like I should sell these and the whole point of the store is to build revenue so that it could sustain the magazine and the digital show and all of the work that I do for basically the magazine because um, magazines are hard to find with advertising down you know you all hear the stories and a lot of them aren't making it a lot of the ones that we love so much is not thriving the way that they used to because you have to find the funding for it a lot of them are going nonprofit. it's just a lot of things just tied up into that and so one vision that I have had was to sustain it through the online store so if you get a chance please go and support the store because if you support the store you are definitely supporting the publication the magazine and giving me the reach and the opportunity that um that i need to talk to everyday people to to tell the stories of the rust belt cities to have that sankofa approach to talking about our history and making it allowing it to make sense for our present and bring together the the tie to our future which is so important. If you've been following me over the years, you know that that is my mission and that I love doing that work and I love doing this work. So I had to find a way to make it work, right? Um, and I, this is the work that I wanna do for the rest of my life. Not that I'm old, I'm only 40, not 40, 39. I feel like I'm so excited about turning 40. When I get to tell you guys what I have planned, you're going to see why I'm so excited and I'm already planning things. So I'm there, but I'm not there because I'm not there yet. I have to allow time to take its time, right? So that's what I've been up to and I'm excited about the work that's coming forth. Um, I have this season of four episodes and the four episodes, this first one is talking about poverty and wealth in the Rust Belt cities or um, I guess poverty through wealth. <laughs> it's just a complicated conversation. Um, on July 21st, I'll be talking about the rise in entrepreneurship. Um, on July 28th, defining everyday people, which is something I feel like we have to do because we like to talk about everyday people when talk about, uh, and I just say we, cause I'm just speaking generally those in media to, to some degree. And it seems as though everyday people are turning into popular people. What's up with that? What's up? What's up with that? We are getting more platforms and the opportunity to expose our greatness and we turn to popularity. That's a problem. And the last episode, which will be on August 4th, we'll be addressing domestic violence data. And I will be talking about a lot of the shows are, are talking about data and information. Um, uh, and it's usually preparing I've on the website. So that this, this particular show will be dedicated to the data because the next issue that I have coming out in Domestic Violence Awareness Month in October will strictly focus on domestic violence information, um, conversations, and um, hopefully more so overcoming and just transparency, authenticity, and overcoming and, and, and taking you through the different experiences of possible experiences of domestic violence. So that's an important conversation that we have to have. Right? Because we want to be a better people all together and we want to pass down better things to our children and their children and, and, and better uh, relational experiences. I don't talk a lot about relationships, but the issues that come out of them, we can discuss. I don't, I don't know. It's a lot of people out there talking about how to find love, how, you know, get, get your Kevin Samuels on. Do what you do. I, I, I don't do that. So that is some, that's what I've been working on. That is what I'm moving forward and working on. And that's that. <laughs> so I um, have been really thinking about um, how lately I've been a little pressed and frustrated about a lot of the issues that we have been experiencing. And so on top of doing my work, I've been doing a lot of thinking and I have been doing a lot of watching and listening and taking my time to understand where we are as a society and I can't be the only one I don't hear many people saying it because tragedy happens and we just kind of go on with our lives 
And I don't know if, if, if we're numb or just accepting to this new way of life or this new way of living in a constant state of what's next, but it's not the life my 20 year old self envisioned. And it's definitely not the adult life that I want for my children. So we want to thrive and create wealth and pass down things and traditions that matter to our children and our grandchildren that honor the legacies that we've established. That's what's important for us to talk about. And that's why it's important for us to talk about things like the Pembroke, Pembroke pipeline in depth and have conversations about what's happening there. Let's take a look. Pembroke is one of the oldest black rural townships. It was founded by a runaway slave named Pap Tedder before the Emancipation Proclamation. Folk history tells us that he and his family of 18 children escaped from North Carolina around 1861. According to Illinois State Museum, with a population of about 2,000, Pembroke Township, 65 miles south of Chicago is one of the largest rural, black communities north of the Mason-Dixon Line. It is also one of the poorest places in the nation. Many black farmers came to this area during the Great Migration, finding Chicago to be overcrowded and inhospitable, they were able to buy land in the township at low prices. The poor soil made it nearly impossible to establish profitable farms. Census Report Analysis of Pembroke Township, Kankakee County As the most current census 2025 years data. Pembroke Township has a population of 1,529. The median age is 51 with 20% of the township population being between the ages of 60 to 69, the second highest age group is 10 to 19, being 15% of the township population. The population is 51% male and 49% female, 77% of the population identify as black. 70% of the population make under $50,000 a year. 24.3% are below the poverty line. Some see these issues and view the NICOR Pembroke pipeline as a way to help. According to NICOR Gas, the Illinois Commerce Commission has approved a certificate of public convenience and necessity that will allow NICOR Gas to include Hopkins Park and Pembroke Township as part of its service territory and construct the facilities necessary to provide service to the area. Bringing natural gas to the village of Hopkins Park is a long-time, organic initiative driven by the residents of the community and supported by numerous advocates, including state and local leaders like Pembroke Township Supervisor Sam Payton. Hopkins Park Mayor Mark Hodge, and Illinois State Representative Jackie Haas and State Senator Patrick Joyce, national organizations like Rainbow Push, and businesses like NICOR Gas. We are proud to work with the community and bring natural gas as a low-cost, reliable and safe energy source for those who want it, while bolstering economic and infrastructure investments that could lead to job creation. Without this energy choice, residents are forced to use propane, wood burning and other potentially dangerous heating methods that pose health risks and fire hazards. Pembroke is a large farming community and some are saying they want an energy upgrade, but they want renewables, not fossil fuels. There has been protests and the people of Pembroke speaking out. We will continue to follow the story and deliver the outcome. Many of us millennials have seen, I'm a millennial, right? Yeah. Millennial is what, 25 to 41 or something like that. I'm a millennial, okay? I'm 39 years old. I, I almost messed that up earlier, but <laughs> I'm definitely 39 years old, <laughs> not 40 yet. But as a millennial, we have watched many of our communities, black communities, communities that were built um, off the backs of hard working class black people. We have watched them deteriorate over the years for many different reasons, whether it's gang violence, whether it's uh, drugs, whether it, I mean, it's so many things that we can put in the pipeline of that deterioration, right? We have seen it, millennials and Gen X and your boomers as well. I mean, we all can recall a community that we would go to and we would just see black excellence. And now if we drive down those streets, they have deteriorated. And, you know, some of us can say that that's strategic. Some of us can say that, you know, um, people leave and people leave. And, and we see that, and especially nowadays, we see many 
of the descendants of the great migration, uh, the people who migrated north from the south, from the segregated south, many of their descendants are going back south. So, so that plays a part as well with reason. It plays a part with reason, but there's communities like Bronzeville in the Chicagoland area that's rich in history, that's rich in black excellence. It was the spot for black excellence and it, the area has been um, the people of that area have tried to revive it. They have tried to do so many things and it has its history and it has its issues. But what's going on with Bronzeville now? Such a historical town. What's the story behind how it's thriving or if it's thriving now? Let's take a look. The incredible history of Bronzeville. In its heyday from the 1910s to the 1940s, it rivaled Harlem. We all know about the Harlem Renaissance. It rivaled them as a cultural and political capital of African Americans. That's largely due to a stretch of Bronzeville called the Stroll. This section of State Street from 26th to 29th Streets was famous for its bustling activity. Bronzeville was known or well known for its nightclubs and its dance halls, the jazz, blues, and gospel music that developed with the migration of Southern musicians attracted many diverse listeners and admirers. Let's just be honest, it was the Black metropolis. And we talked about this briefly in one of our other segments, but it was rich with history and it was flourishing. It was the modern day Renaissance. It had the cultural contributions of so many, like Gwendolyn Brooks, who was a Pulitzer Prize winner, and the civil rights activist Ida B. Wells, the legendary music musician Louis Armstrong, and so many more. It is said, I haven't done much research to find out the truth in this, but it will be interesting to find out. But it was said that the name Bronzeville comes from African-Americans' skin color because it was closer to bronze than black. The name was popularized by the Chicago Defender, a black newspaper with nationwide circulation. If you all recall in a previous segment that we covered on One Purpose magazine, we talked a little bit about the housing market in Chicago and we addressed the redlining, which is a story that's been revealed over the past few years. But Bronzeville fell into decline after the end of the racially restricted housing. Upper and middle class families moved away and overpopulation and poverty overwhelmed the neighborhood. Now today, Black Heritage, Heritage Tours guides and visits uh, nine of the of many of the historical architectural landmarks that remain from the historic community. While neighborhood groups and business interests continue to work towards rebuilding the city within a city that was once a national center of urban African American commerce and art. Today, you can visit Bronzeville and some of the places that you can go to is the Chicago Defender Building, which is a wonderful historical landmark. You can visit the Victory Monument. You can go to the DuSable Museum, Ida B. Wells House. You can visit the Stephen A. Douglas Tomb and Memorial, Harold Washington Cultural Center, the 31st Street Beach, you can also visit stores now. We have Gallery Gachard, which is an art museum. There's places that you can go and eat. Blue 47, Harold's Chicken Shack, Pearl's Place. I love that place. And places where you can go and have coffee now. And it's just trying to be revived. And there's a lot of historical landmarks that are worth going to visit so that we can have an idea and so we can know and that we and we can also tap into that greatness that comes along with some of the black excellence that was built 
in our past. And remember that we are reflections of that excellence and continuing to build. Currently, the Bronzeville population is 24,919 residents. The median age in Bronzeville, it's 34, around 35 years old. Most of the citizens are U.S. born. There's a 55% of um, female population in Bronzeville with a number of white collar workers and a lot of new things that's coming into Bronzeville as well. One in particular is Northwestern Medicine is planning for a new 120,000 square foot advanced outpatient care center on the 4800 block of South Cottage Grove. So it's so many things to look forward to when it comes to economic development and the community. So many opportunities to continue to build for Black excellence, to continue to go to a community that was once thriving and rebuild in that area. So as of late, we have witnessed a few different mass shootings that has just torn us apart, torn our hearts apart. And me personally, on my birthday, on May 14th, which is my birthday, I was sitting down preparing to look at the economic development plans of Buffalo, New York, because I was planning a visit. I wanted to go there and visit the community and start making my rounds for the different communities that are considered Rust Belt cities. And Buffalo, New York was one that I wanted to go to because I wanted to visit the Niagara Falls on the United States side. And so Buffalo, New York was one of the places that I was researching. And as I was sitting down doing my research, there was coverage on the news of a mass shooter in a grocery store. I turned the TV up and it just so happened to be in the same place and it just so happened to be in the same place where I was looking at the economic development plans for and I really couldn't believe that I was sitting in these moments in this particular moment where I was doing due diligence and someone had possibly did some of that same due diligence for a different reason. That was devastating to me. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it was happening. Um, the people who were the victims of this terrible, terrible mass shooting were people that I know would have been so um, important to interview because they held history. They held information about a town that is so interesting and that tell the story of generations of people who have lived through what One Purpose Magazine talks about all the time. So I had to dig a little deeper to get to know more about the people of Buffalo, New York. Check it out. Buffalo, New York is 35.2% black. The majority of the residents are high school graduates. The median household income is $39,677. 28.3% of the population is in poverty. Majority of the citizens are native born with the median age of 33 years old. The largest demographic living in poverty are females 25 to 34, then females 18 to 24, and then males 25 to 34. The largest ethnicity living in poverty are black by 